It takes balls to land on Mars. After spending years of hard work, hundreds of millions of dollars in funding to get a spacecraft all the way from the Earth to the Red Planet, the worst thing that could possibly happen is to watch it all fail at the last moment. So how do we make sure our Mars rover sticks the landing? These are NASA's giant inflatable balls. Let's flash back to the mid-1990s. Grunge rock on MTV, cell phones the size of bricks, and Bill Clinton playing the saxophone. The good old days. And in the midst of all this, NASA is trying to figure out how to land their Pathfinder mission safely on the planet Mars. It wouldn't be the first time that Americans had reached the surface of our neighboring planet. It was the twin landers Viking 1 and Viking 2 that had made the first soft touchdowns on Mars and survived long enough to transmit their findings back to Earth. That was in 1976. The Mars landing technology pioneered by the Viking missions is actually still being used to this day. It's essentially a four-part system with a ballistic entry through the atmosphere, followed by a parachute deployment, then a propulsive deacceleration before a final shock absorber cradles the lander as it impacts the surface. Even with a throttled propulsion system, Viking 1 and 2 hit the surface of Mars going about 9 kilometers per hour, but the force was absorbed by special landing legs that compressed as they impacted the ground. The fact that NASA pulled this off not once, but twice in the mid-70s is insane. Even up to the present day, landing on Mars has proven extremely difficult. The Red Planet is a graveyard for failed missions, there are two primary reasons for this. Number one is atmosphere, or lack thereof. You can't simply parachute down to a soft landing the way that you do on the Earth. It's not physically possible because Mars only has around 1% the atmospheric density. This is why an elaborate system with rockets and shock absorbers is necessary. Number two is distance. The tens of millions of miles that separate Earth and Mars make for a communications delay of at least five minutes one way, so the lander's guidance computer is flying solo. By the time we get a signal on Earth that the landing system might have a problem, the vehicle has already crashed before we can correct it. And a bonus thing number three is the surface of Mars itself. It is covered in a random mess of extremely jagged rocks. If we look at photos of the moon surface from Apollo missions, there are definitely rocks around, but you can see that the areas they landed on were mostly flat, smooth deserts. While if you look at this image from Viking 1, you can see a gnarly pointed rock just a few feet away from the landing site. If the vehicle had come down on top of that thing, it would have been game over. It's just a roll of the dice and NASA got lucky. So when the NASA Pathfinder mission came around 20 years later, the engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory did not want to rely on luck alone. This is where the balls come in. There were two major changes enacted from Viking to Pathfinder. One, they decided to separate the engines from the lander prior to touchdown, and two, the landing legs were out. So, if we know that landing on Mars is going to be incredibly difficult and treacherous, how do we give ourselves the widest possible margin for error? We don't land, we bounce. By employing the airbag method, Pathfinder can impact the ground at a vertical angle up to 55 kilometers per hour, or a grazing angle up to 100 kilometers per hour. And if it happens to land on a gnarly rock, doesn't matter, it'll just bounce off and the lander will just keep bouncing along until it finally comes to a stop. There are four interconnected airbags on the Pathfinder lander, one for each side of the tetrahedron shape, and each bag would inflate into six spheres, or balls, that gave the lander a much more rounded shape on impact and allowed it to bounce freely in all directions. The fabric of the airbags is not attached directly to the rover, there are actually a series of ropes that crisscross over the bags and hold them down. These balls are incredibly tough. NASA used a synthetic fiber called Vectrin. It's almost 
twice the strength of Kevlar and performs better in cold temperatures. The engineers found that multiple thin layers of Vectrin actually perform better than one thick one. So there are four outer layers of lightweight threads surrounding one soft inner air bladder. These balls have to move fast. They go from stored to fully inflated in just one second. The explosive activation comes from three gas generators. These are essentially just small rocket motors that burn a solid fuel. The exhaust byproduct from the rocket fuel is what inflates the airbags. NASA had to thoroughly test their balls before deploying them on Mars. The team created a simulated Mars environment with rocks that were chosen to represent the closest geological match to actual Mars rocks. They rigged this up inside a vacuum chamber to simulate the Mars atmosphere and then used industrial bungee cords to slingshot the 800-pound lander mock-up at 100 kilometers per hour into the test platform. Then the whole thing had to be captured by giant, energy-absorbing nets so that they could do it all over again. Every tear and puncture in the Vectron airbags had to be repaired by hand by a technician named Eleanor Foraker, who was the same person who hand-sewed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's spacesuits for Apollo 11, so she was kind of a big deal. After years of testing, NASA finally certified their airbag system in April 1996, eight months prior to the Pathfinder launch. Here's how things went down. In 1997, after cruising for seven months, the Pathfinder vehicle arrives at the planet Mars. Once the angle of attack is set, the Pathfinder capsule separates from its crew's staged propulsion module to begin entry. The velocity is over 20,000 kilometers per hour, and Pathfinder is heading straight toward the Martian surface. Now, the atmosphere of Mars is thin, but it's not totally useless for slowing down either. The aero shell surrounding Pathfinder has an ablative heat shield that will punch into the atmosphere and bring the velocity down to around 1300 km per hour. At this point, it's safe to deploy the supersonic parachute, and that will get us down to a terminal velocity of around 240 km per hour. By now, the heat shield has done its job, so that gets tossed. Next up, the lander is lowered down on a 20 meter long tether cable. While all of this is going on, a Windows 95 era computer is making a series of very important calculations using radar to determine the altitude and velocity of the vehicle. This is going to be very important for what comes next. At an altitude of 355 meters, the gas generators fire and NASA's 24 giant balls are inflated in less than a second. At just 98 meters altitude, the computer fires up the landing engines. The idea here is to get the velocity of the lander down to a hover just above the surface. At a 21 meters altitude, the computer cuts the tether and drops Pathfinder. With the last few seconds of thrust, the landing rockets push the aero shell and parachute away. The airbags impact the ground at 50 kilometers per hour and bounce nearly 16 meters back into the air. Remember that the gravity on Mars is only about one-third that amount on Earth, so there's not much holding it down. It takes at least another 15 bounces before the lander finally comes to a rest. The whole process takes only about four minutes, so the very happy people on Earth had no idea what happened until it was all over. Once the lander comes to a rest, the airbags are deflated and the three sides of the tetrahedron open up like flower petals. The Pathfinder happened to land on its bottom, but the actuators on the pedals are powerful enough to self-right no matter how it happens to land. And looking at this panoramic view captured by the lander's mast camera, you can see the deflated airbags around each side, and you can see just how rocky and jagged this area of the planet is. Imagine trying to come down here and land on legs like an Apollo mission. Would not have gone well. Pathfinder was actually so successful that NASA decided to double down on their giant inflatable balls for the next shot at Mars. Much like with the original Vikings back in the 70s, NASA chose to take full advantage of the Mars transit window and send two landers at the same time. These were twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity. Basic landing strategy was pretty much the same this time around. NASA did have to redesign their balls to account for the heavier payloads, 
these new rovers were the size of golf carts after all. A new round of drop testing with the updated payload was causing serious abrasions and tears on the airbags, so they required an upgrade. NASA techs added more Vectron to the structure, now with six outer layers of lightweight fiber surrounding an inner air bladder of doubled up heavyweight Vectron layers. NASA also made the parachute size 40% larger than the Pathfinder mission to accommodate for the extra weight. And this paid off in spades when the first of the two landers, Spirit, made its approach on January 4, 2004. Just prior to Mars entry, Spirit had been experiencing a series of computer troubles and things were looking pretty sketchy for landing. We know that things did not go according to plan on the way down. Spirit's parachute inflated later than expected and the landing rockets fired for a shorter amount of time, so it came in fast. Spirit bounced close to 30 times across half a mile of terrain. It took up to 10 minutes for it to finally come to a stop and settle down, but it survived thanks to NASA's giant inflatable balls. Unfortunately, the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit, and Opportunity would bring an end to the era of NASA's giant inflatable balls. The reason being that NASA's 2016 Mars rover, Curiosity, had now grown to the size of a crossover SUV and was far too heavy for an airbag landing. But on the bright side, NASA had significantly better technology in play this time around. Instead of dropping into the Martian atmosphere like a rock, the Curiosity entry capsule had an advanced system of maneuvering thrusters. So, as it was coming down, the onboard computer was scanning the surface and autonomously deciding on an ideal landing zone then adjusting its course to hit the ideal angle of attack. After getting dialed in for a safe landing zone, the parachute is deployed like normal to bring down the terminal velocity until the landing engines are ready to kick in. This is where things start to go really different than before. As the landing engines fire up, the parachute is released and the rover makes its way down with a kind of jetpack style descent. Then with a few meters left above the ground, the engines settle into a hover, and instead of cutting the cable and dropping the lander, it gets slowly lowered down on a sky crane that sets it gently on the Martian surface before the jetpack flies away to crash land at a safe distance. So it's still the same general idea carried forward from the Viking landing to Pathfinder to Spirit and Opportunity and into the present day, just with a few updates for increased safety and reliability as technology allowed. And this is the same way that NASA landed on Mars in 2021. The jetpack and sky crane performed beautifully for the even heavier Perseverance rover. In the meantime, only one other nation has managed to land successfully on Mars, that's China. But they didn't use big inflatable balls either, so that kind of seals the deal that modern computer guidance and rocket technology has become the new status quo leaving NASA's giant inflatable balls as just a beautiful memory from a simpler time.